Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm Commodore Samuelson. Many of you are familiar with me. I'm the Director of Jewish Studies and Regents Professor of History and Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism. I trust that uh, 2024 has started well for all of you. Although we are living through very difficult times, given the attack on Israel by Hamas, on October 7th, 2023. And the fact that we have an, an, you know, an ensuing war uh, against Hamas right now in Gaza. We do not know yet, of course, how this will unfold and let alone how it's gonna end. But we do know that the war has brought about rising tide of anti-Semitism in the United States and in Europe as well as attacks on Israelis and Israeli institutions in the United States and online. The, real, the issues online are actually quite serious. Given the tragic loss of life on October 7th and the unspeakable suffering of the hostages who were and still are, some still are, held by Hamas, and the daily loss of life of Israeli soldiers and civilians, it seems that this lecture and the rest of the lectures that we in Jewish studies are going to do this semester, they all appear to be kind of a luxury or perhaps even a form of escapism. And yet I would like to suggest that uh, as Jews who care about the pursuit of wisdom and the expansion of knowledge, we are really obligated to continue our commitment to adult Jewish education by holding this event tonight and the next two weeks and all the other programs that we're gonna do during the semester. This evening is our first lecture of a three-part lecture series on Josephus. So here are some of the questions that will concern us. Why should we pay attention to Josephus Flavius? Who was he? Uh, what did he contribute to Jewish culture? What did he contribute to Christian culture? What did he leave for posterity? What kind of text did he leave for posterity? Who read him and how he was read? How was he understood? All of these questions, including the questions of his relevance to our life today, all of these questions will be engaged in this lecture series. And we're going to start tonight uh, with uh, Professor Francoise Mirguet, who's going to explain to us or address the question, why Josephus? So a few words about Francoise. Maybe some of you remember her because she uh, participated in the uh, lecture series on ancient roots, Judaism and ancient Christianity, and she did other programs online as well. Uh, but let me say a little bit more about her illustrious career. So she's an associate professor in the School of uh, International Letters and Culture, that's Silk, here at ASU. She focuses on ancient uh, Hebrew and Judaic Hellenistic culture and on the interplay between Jews and Christians in antiquity. Uh, professor Merguer holds a PhD in Theology and Biblical Studies from the Université Catholique uh, de Louvain in Belgium. She got that in 2007. She also has two MA degrees uh, in theology, one from Harvard University and another one from uh, the University of, uh, in Louvain. And then she has three different BA degrees uh, from, from her alma mater, from the same university in Belgium. She has a, a, a BA degree in philosophy, one in biblical philology and one in religious studies. So she's very well trained indeed. Uh, Professor Merguet is the author most recently uh, of the edited volume, An Early History of Compassion, Emotions, and Imagination uh, in Hellenistic Judaism. It came out uh, in 2017, came by Cambridge University Press, and she has many essays. I'll just give you a few titles to give you kind of a taste of her uh, scholarship. So she has an essay actually on Josephus, which is our focus for tonight, under the title, Josephus Lamentations in the Judean War, Body, Emotional Resistance and Gender. That's one essay that came out in 2022. She has another essay 
uh, on another dimension of her work, which is the self and the emotions. So it's an essay under the title, Innovative Practices of the Self in Early Jewish Narratives, and a, another essay on the study of emotions in early Jewish texts. So this gives you a sense of how she approaches uh, all those issues from a very interesting angle, focusing on theory of emotions and theory of affects. Uh, she's also the recipient of many prestigious uh, um, fellowships and um, grants. I won't name all of them, uh, but I think that we are very fortunate to have her with us at ASU. Her innovative research makes clear that to understand ancient Judaism, we must take into consideration the enormous diversity within the Jewish community, as well as the cultural interaction between Jews, non-Jews, and of course, they are pagans, and whether they are Romans or Greeks, there's a difference of their reception in each community. But she explains all of them because you truly understand the complexity of that particular time and that particular culture. So her focus tonight, and she's going to start us with this series on Josephus, a very interesting, complex character. I won't take too much of her time uh, to, because he's going to tell her, tell us how complex he was. But you know, he was a Jewish priest. He was a military leader. He was an historian. He was a biblical interpreter. And she's going to make sense of his position in the context of the, the relationship between Rome and Judea. So, Francoise, please uh, start us off. Um, and everybody knows what to do on Zoom by now because we have so many years of doing it by now. So put your questions in the Q&A part of your screen rather than on um, on the um, chat, if you if you please. And since I cannot really hear what's going on, I think that uh, maybe Daniel, uh, you can help us maybe handling. Uh, the Q&A with the audience. Would that work? Yeah, I, I think that'll work, Kava. Sure. Okay. Sure, I'm here. All right, so I won't be able to hear it unless, uh, Lisa, you have a way to make it possible for me I, to hear. Uh, I what, do, what but I we're going to, I'm going to let you hang up and then uh, I'm going to mute my screen and then call me on my phone and I'll let you listen through my phone. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. All Thanks, right, thank you so patient. much. And yes, and I'm sorry for all those uh, technical difficulties. Take it away, Francois. Thank you so much, Hava, for this wonderful introduction. And welcome to all of you tonight. Um, the little delay actually allowed us to allow allowed some of you to share about your location tonight. And it was really a true joy to read um, about so many of you joining us from all parts of the United States. So welcome. Thank you for being here and thank you for your interest in Josephus. It's really a great joy to be able to share about my research, about my interest, a little bit of my research about Josephus. Before I turn to my PowerPoint, I wanted to turn actually and show you just behind me um, the books there, uh, in fact, um, the, the Greek text of Josephus and translations um, commentaries in English and in French. And it's not, I didn't prepare that. Those books are just there behind me, um, just already showing um, the, the centrality really of Josephus for um, an historian of late antiquity. So let's start. So as the first step in our series, I'm concentrating tonight on the question, who was Josephus? And um, here's a brief outline of my presentation tonight. Um, I'll just outline the significance of Josephus, his different works. Briefly, I will also outline his historical context. And then I will move to Josephus' life. Um, that's going to be quite a long time. As you know, Josephus had a long and eventful life. I will then move to um, shifts in scholarship and the new appreciation that he receives today. And 
for the last part of this presentation, I will actually do um, a case study and look at the prologue or the proem of the Jewish war, which in, contains um, laments, lamentations by Josephus. And this is a recent research of mine. Have I in fact mentioned um, the article that I published on that subject? And I chose this case study as a way to exemplify um, Josephus' relevance today and give us a sense of, a little bit more perhaps, a sense of the man behind his writing. So Josephus' significance, so it's um, outlined very briefly um, the main aspects of Josephus' relevance today, different aspects that I will engage differently in this talk tonight. So first of all, Josephus is our only continuous source of information about Jewish history from the second century BCE to the first century CE. That's the history that he covers in his book. And he is of particular relevance for the year 66 to 70, the Judean War, in which he was an eyewitness. Josephus is also a witness of the complexities of Jewish identity in first century CE, both in Judea, in the land of Israel, and in the diaspora since his life, since during his life, he lived both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and um, in, in Rome, in the diaspora. Um, Josephus is also a witness of Jewish thought and scriptural interpretation in late antiquity. Um, I will talk a little bit here about Jewish thought. Um, the topic of scriptural interpretation will be the topic of the second episode in our series. Um, sorry. So Josephus is also a witness, more largely, of minority existence in the Roman Empire. Josephus is very interesting for Jewish history, but even beyond that, is indeed a witness of the tensions between loyalty to native people, but also to the empire. Witness of tensions between different languages, different cultures, and tensions also between social classes, which was quite an important element um, in the Roman world. Um, Josephus is also a contemporary of Paul, and the authors of the gospel. Um, it's also interesting for Christianity, especially because he is the alleged, let's say, author of a testimony about Jesus. Um, this is a complex question. We can talk about it tonight if we have time or if there are questions about it, or the topic will be um, discussed in um, later sessions. So let's look now at Josephus' works. So we have four different collections, um, which span um, between 70 CE and the late 90s, so the second part of Josephus' life. The first collection is the Jewish War, sometimes also called the Judean War, um, both words um, translate the same Greek term. Um, so it has seven volumes and it covers the year 200 BCE to 70 CE. Josephus writes that he wrote first a draft in Aramaic that he shared with different subdued nations by the Romans and also some Jewish communities in the diaspora. That seems to have been a very rough outline. And then in the 70s, 
So Josephus wrote in a Greek that impressive collection, um, historiographic work. About 10 years later, he continued with another collection of volumes, the Jewish Antiquities. This time, Josephus starts much earlier with the goal to write an entire history of the Jews. And he starts with a retelling of the Hebrew scriptures. So he starts with creation. And he continues up to 66, to the beginning of the war. So part of the Jewish antiquities, as you can see, overlap with the Jewish war um, in, in a very interesting way because it shows the evolution um, of Josephus' thought. Then a um, little later, uh, Josephus wrote um, another volume, perhaps meant as um, an addition to the Jewish antiquity, antiquities, which he simply calls his life. This is a kind of autobiography, or at least of partial autobiography, as it covers um, only a portion of Josephus' life, the years 66-67, which are the year during which, as a general, he led Jewish troops in the Galilee. Um, so it's not a full autobiography in the contemporary sense, since it is partial, but it's not less really interesting, as um, in fact, perhaps, probably, the first autobiography in the Western world. Um, and then finally, a last, um, last volume, last collection of volumes, which Josephus published at the very end of his life in the late 90s. It is called Against Apion, and it is a polemic or apologetic work in which Josephus responds to criticisms against Jews. Um, sorry, just um, trying to, I'm sorry about this. So let's then let's now move to um, Josephus' context, a brief historical context. Um, so as you as you know, um, Judea knew a brief period of independence or semi-independence under the Hasmoneans, but in 63 BCE, Jerusalem fell to the Roman general Pompey. Um, about 20 years later, Herod the Great is named king. Uh, but we shouldn't think of Herod's kingship as an independent um, royalty. Indeed, he's a client king of Rome. It is called Philo Romaios, friend of the Romans. And um, during his reign, um, Judea um, is in an indirect submission to Rome. I mentioned, I indicated um, on this slide, coins that were minted under Herod. Um, on the one on the left, you can read, if you read Greek, you can recognize the capital letter Sil from Basileus, which means king, and Herod, can give see your age, um, so Herod, King Herod. And then on the other face of the coin, you can try to imagine which animal is represented there. And perhaps with a little bit of imagination, you can see, you can recognize the eagle. So this is really interesting because as you know, um, the Mosaic law prohibited the representation of um, lived beings, included animals. So this is kind of a transgression. And coins, actually most coins that he minted and coins minted before him under the Hasmoneans 
do not show um, lived beings on them. It is also very interesting because the eagle is, of course, a symbol of Rome. So the coins themselves shows show um, the uh, the dependence of Herodian kingship to Rome. Herod dies in 4 BCE. His kingdom is divided among his sons and his sister. I'm going to show you in a minute the, the map. And that marks a progressive establishment of a, this time, direct Roman war. And here is the map with the different region of Roman Palestine, including Judea, Samaria, Galilee in the north. I'm going to talk um, a lot about it. Um, then let's continue with our historical um, context. Um, Pilate um, becomes governor of Judea in 26 for 10 years. And that's the start of tensions with the local population. Um, then we have the emperorship of Caligula, um, which also is characterized by um, many troubles. In particular, he wants to erect a statue of himself in the temple. Unfortunately, he dies before it can be completed, but we can imagine um, the revolts that that would have elicited. Um, I didn't mention Claudius after Caligula, things a little um, calmer under him, but then in 54, Nero becomes emperor. He names Felix as governor. And then we have many tensions between the Jewish and the non-Jewish population in Roman Palestine, um, including with um, Roman settlers. Um, 64, uh, we have a new governor, Florus, um, and again, um, many tensions with the local population. One of them is um, the fact that Florus uses taxes for the temple for civic purposes, for urban um, improvement. But of course, taxes from the temple were not supposed to be used for those purposes. And that caused um, many revolts from the population. And those culminate in 66 with the Judean War. And I'm going to talk more about that um, when talking about Josephus' life. I wanted to mention, and that's my uh, what I wrote in the um, upper left corner, um, the Jews uh, in the land of Israel during that time are divided um, in their position towards the Romans. So we shouldn't think that it is um, a broad opposition to the Romans. Um, the upper class is in fact pro-Roman. Um, the um, Herodian family, including the two um, Agri Agrippa the first and the second, um, are pro-Roman. Um, Herod, for example, sent his sons to study in Rome. Um, and uh, yeah, so many of um, upper class people actually have some find some benefit in collaborating with the Romans. It's rather the working class which is rebellious and entertains um, hopes. Um, for return to independence. So now I'm going to move to Josephus' life. Um, so jo Josephus was born um, Joseph ben Matatiahu in 37 CE in Jerusalem. He is from a priestly family um, on his father's side. And he has some connection, let's say, with the royal, with royalty on his mother's side. His grandfather married um, a woman from the Hasmonean family who took a few years later the title king. So um, he has some connection there. So both priestly and, and I mean, he's definitely a priest and some connection with royalty. Many times in his work, Josephus calls his family noble. Um, 
and he definitely has an aristocratic background. He grew up in Jerusalem. Um, he was probably conversant with Greek from an early age because he was upper class. Uh, but his mother tongue was, was uh, most probably Aramaic. He also most probably knew Hebrew as well, especially coming from a priestly family. Uh, since we're talking about languages, he mentions um, in his work um, a certain difficulty with the Greek language, um, that, that he, had, he had to study Greek grammar and, um, and, and Greek literature in, in, in order to become proficient, really proficient. So that, of course, is, it's a little difficult to evaluate. But it, it's probable, I said, as I said, that he had some connections with Greek from an early age. Um, so at 16, he acquaints himself with different Jewish schools, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. And he becomes the student of an ascetic man, Banus, living um, in the desert, living a very simple life in the desert. But after all the, those different experiences, he decided to become a Pharisee. And we will see later how his thought um, remained marked by that Pharisaic background. He marries his first wife. And at 26, he actually goes to Rome for a diplomatic journey to advocate for the release of priests imprisoned in Rome. He becomes friends with a Jewish actor, Aliturus, a favorite of Nero, who introduced Josephus to Popeia, the wife of Nero. Um, I mentioned this little um, anecdote because it's typical. It's one of those many anecdotes in Josephus' work that is extremely interesting um, about um, Jewish life in the diaspora. Um, so we see that, um, first of all, there were Jewish actors in Rome, and um, some of them at least had very close contacts with the imperial family. And um, so Josephus is successful. He returned to Judea and he finds there many rebel factions. He, you know, he finds that the, uh, the, the, the feelings of revolt against Rome is growing. And Josephus warns them um, against the Rome's force. And he said very early on, on a war would end in disaster. In spring 66, the um, Judean rebels conquer Masada, which was a Roman garrison at the time. They interrupt the daily offerings to the emperor. They conquer the Antonia and the palace of Herod. So all places symbolic of Roman presence. In the summer 66, the Roman army led by Sistius Gallus invades Galilee, Jerusalem, and several other cities. And against all expectations, the Judean troops defeats it and it retreats. And this is a key moment um, because uh, that actually, that uh, the episode um, led the Judean troops to believe that there was, in fact, a chance for them to definitely repel Roman armies. They thought that you know, there was actually a possibility for them to regain their independence. Again, the upper class um, people like Josephus understood that this was just a mishap and that um, Judean troops would not really be able to fight the Roman army. But that gave actually really um, a momentum to um, to the, rub to the rebels. So that same summer, Josephus is appointed general in Galilee. And then we have two different versions there. I told you that uh, sometimes we have different perspectives in different, uh, in, uh, different Josephus works. In the Jewish war, Josephus said that he was named general in order to lead the resistance against the Romans. While in his later work, The Life, he said that it was to convince the rebels to relinquish the weapons. What is true? Is there really a conflict? Scholars are divided. Um, some said, well, no, 
well, you know, the life actually shows us that, um, actually the, sorry, the Jewish war shows us that at the beginning, Josephus could have been a supporter of the revolt. Um, but some said, well, perhaps it's two different ways to look at the same thing. Um, and in many events, Josephus was a short strategist and he may have um, accepted this um, position of general, in fact, with, um, with the intention to convince them to yield to the Romans. Um, especially in the life, um, Josephus unveils his strategy. So to pretend to abide by the rebels' purpose, but in reality, try to rein them in and to subdue the most extremist, the most violent ones. So winter 66, Nero appoints Vespasian to lead the reconquest of Judea. And 66, 67 um, clashes um, develop between Rome and the rebels. Josephus tried to compromise and to delay, to delay both um, armed revolts from the side of the rebels and try also to delay the reconquest by the Romans. It's really in between camps. On June 67, Vespasian's troops is the Galilean cities and um, the city of Yotapada here is besieged. You may not have heard of Yotapata, which is the Greek word of that city, but you may have heard of Yotfat, which is the modern Hebrew name of that, not really a town right now, but of that place. Josephus is in Tiberias at the time, and he immediately moves to Yotfat, and he repels Roman troops several times. Um, in July, the Romans seize the town, raise it to the ground, kill and make prisoners or men. So what happened to Josephus? Well, Josephus escapes during the attack and jumps into a pit. This is a very well-known episode, so it may um, you, you may remember this. So he hides there with 40 men. Eventually, they are betrayed by a woman in the group. Vespasian sends officers to convince Josephus to surrender, and Josephus at first refuses. And then he remembers his dreams about Rome's victory, predictions about Rome's victory. And he decides to surrender and he writes, I willingly surrender to the Romans and I consent to live, but I take you, God, as witness that I go not as a traitor, but as your minister. Josephus presents his um, surrender as an act of faith. So Josephus' companions recommend suicide. Josephus resists. Um, his companions attempt to kill him. And then Josephus, as usual, um, devises a trick. He suggests that they draw lots to determine who will kill whom. Josephus, he writes, by the providence of God, is left with another man as the last ones. He persuades him to stay alive and they surrender. Josephus is brought before Vespasian and he sends um, Titus. Titus has compassion of Josephus, at least that's what Josephus tells us, and he appeals for his life. Josephus presents himself as a messenger of greater destinies and he predicts that Vespasian and his son are to become emperors. Just between us, he's not the only one. Other people had made the same prediction. Um, but still, it works. And Vespasian um, gives gifts to Josephus, although a prisoner of war. And on the right, you see a memorial to the Jewish defenders of Yotfat um, that stands on the site today. So Josephus is a prisoner of war. He first um, is kept first in Caesarea. Where in fact he marries a Jewish woman, um, a prisoner there, actually contrary to Jewish cost customs, according to the Jewish law, according to which a priest cannot um, marry a prisoner. 
Um, he, uh, Vespasian indeed, becomes emperor in 69 and remembers Josephus' prophecy. He releases him and becomes his protector. And that's at the time that Josephus takes the name Flavius, the family name of Vespasian. Um, Josephus goes to Alexandria with Vespasian and Titus. He marries a third wife there, has three sons from her. But then in 70, in the spring, um, he's sent back to Palestine for the siege of Jerusalem, where he serves as a mediator and interpreter, um, according to his account, sometimes in, in really in the first line. Um, in September of that year, that's the fall of Jerusalem, the temple is burned and destroyed. Uh, the city is also um, totally destroyed. Josephus requests the release of closed ones, and his request is um, granted. He also asked for some copies of the Jewish scriptures, which were held in the temple, and he received some of those copies that probably will be useful to him in his historiographic work. So 71, Titus brings Josephus to Rome. Vespasian lets him live in his former house, and gives um, Josephus a Roman citizenship and a pension. Um, mid Josephus, uh, mid seventies, Josephus divorces his latest wife and marries um, his fourth and last mm -hmm. wife, a Jewish woman from Crete, and has two more sons uh, with her. May seventy four, that's the massive suicide in Masada, um, the fall of the fortress. So Josephus is not an eyewitness of that. He's in Rome already, but he tells us about it in detail. Um, he, after um, Titus' death, um, Domitian, uh, the following emperor, continues to favor Josephus. We have no evidence that he ever returned to Judea, although he was granted some lands there, and he dies in Rome around 100 C. Okay, so now that we have reviewed um, Josephus' life, um, I would like to uh, briefly look at some shifts in scholarship and how things changed um, in, in how Josephus has been perceived. And you will see that's pretty interesting. So let's, let's begin with a traditional reception. So in Christian communities, um, Christian, so Josephus um, talks about Jesus. Uh, we can, you know, as I said, uh, develop that later. Um, and so for the Christians, um, Josephus was a symbol of the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies, or at least alleged prophecies, as found in the gospel about the temple and its destruction. And um, what you know, Paul called the replacement of the Jews by the Christians. So Christian uh, Christians uh, re revered Josephus, uh, probably not for the right reasons, but at least that that's actually why um, Josephus' works are kept until today. In Jewish communities, by contrast. Josephus is viewed as a traitor and as an apostate. His history is also denigrated as reflecting a Flavian view, a Roman view, not a Jewish view. Um, scholarship until the 19th century um, also view, uh, read Josephus' works as Roman propaganda but also as a compilation of earlier Jewish works. They see Josephus only as an editor, as a compiler with little creativity of his own. They denigrate his role both as a historian and as a theologian. Since the, I would say the, the last um, third of the 20th century and today, scholarship has developed a new appreciation of Josephus, recognizing his authorship, and um, his, so his role really as an author, not only as a compiler, and also his literary creativity. His, uh, as a historian, actually his account is actually deemed uh, more reliable today, more complex, more ambiguous, but also more reliable. 
Um, his theological views, which I'm not going to talk too much about that, that's going to be the, the focus of um, our next um, talk, are also viewed in a more coherent way. Um, and this attention to how he rewrites the Jewish past. And finally, his political stance is also recognized as more original and independent. And I'm going to give you um, some example. So Josephus' self-positioning in his work, um, we see him um, as a proponent of peace with Rome um, since the beginning and during the war as well. Um, Joseph, as I told you, present himself as you know an aristocrat from a noble family and like a contempt for the insurgents that he called the mob. And that's a way also for him to relate with the Romans. You know, with, with, who shared the same um, kind of contempt for uh, for mobs, for working class people. Um, he praises noble death, so suicide, um, suicide in order not to surrender, but rather himself chooses to save his own life. So there's an, an ambiguous. Um, posture there where he admires those who do it um, but his own choice is to save his life and he gives it a theological reason God gave us life and we have to honor it and um, likewise he recommends his contemporaries to save yourself he interprets the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple as a divine punishment especially for the internal strife under the Hasmoneans. And he, he even said, well, if the Romans had not destroyed Jerusalem, well, God would have done it himself. That's a theological view, but that's also a political view because that's also a way to reduce the role of the Romans in the tragedy. That's also a way to say, to regain, to claim um, some agency in those events. He perceives himself as a new Jeremiah, both witnessed the fall of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple, both preached surrender, both interpret the destruction as divine punishment. He seems himself in the continuity of the scriptural prophet. So as I told you, he was a Pharisee, and uh, this interpretation of the fall of Jerusalem as the punishment for the sin of the people, that's actually a typical Pharisaic um, belief in God's retribution and providence. Um, next week, um, Professor um, Stan Cockin may talk about uh, his views about Israel's eschatological vindication, especially in his uh, reading of Daniel, um, his uh, interpretation of the last power, the power of Rome, so ultimately to be, um, to be overcome, to be destroyed, and um, uh, so opening the future for an eschatological vindication of, of Israel. Um, so Josephus is also a constant advocate for the Jewish people. And um, we're probably going to hear about that also uh, next week. Um, Josephus constantly responds to polemics, to slanders um, against Jewish communities. And he praises the courage of um of the of the troops, the wisdom of its leaders, the richness of its traditions, and then now let's let's look a little at the um, Josephus' positioning towards Rome. Um, as I said, uh, ambiguous. So certainly we see um, Josephus' flattery for the emperor and for his family that was inescapable, but also his irony, sometimes excessive praise that may reveal his irony and his sense, well, I do it because I have to, but in fact, um, you know, I have reservations about this. Um, he reports Roman armies as of brutality, he doesn't hesitate to mention the pointless violence of many Roman governors. He doesn't spare the emperors as well, including Titus, noting, noting at times his cruel behavior. Um, as I said, he attribute, attributes the fall of Jerusalem to divine agency, thus reducing, reducing the role of Rome. Um, 
also very characteristic is what is he doesn't say. Um, if you look at Roman propaganda of the time, um, there is a lot about Rome, quote unquote, civilizing and pacifying role, even mission in the world. This is something that Josephus does not mention. And I finish with a quote from Carrie Gruen. Um, Polybius and Josephus suggest a slightly subversive and cautiously cynical perspective that put them in a category very different from the apologist for the emperor. I'm going to talk about Polybius later, but for now, so let's know that subversive and cautiously cynical perspective that often is only to be read between the lines. And that's going to be the object of my case study on Josephus' lamentations in the proem or the prologue of the Jewish war. So now bear with me, we're going to read the text. It's a little, a little um, complex as, as Josephus' you know, work is, but there's also a way to give you a sense of his style. So I read, I quote, I recount the actions of each party with accuracy, but I attribute the reflections on the fact to my state of mind and to my own emotions or suffering, same word in Greek, allowing myself to lament the calamities of my homeland. For that a domestic sedition destroyed it, that the Judeans or tyrants dragged Romans' obedient hands and fire on the temple. Titus Caesar, who destroyed it, is himself a witness, who during the entire war, out of compassion for the people held in subjection by the seditious, often deliberately postponed the capture of the city and stalled the siege to allow opportunities for repentance. Typical paragraph here. So Josephus mentioned um, those that, who are ultimately responsible for the fall of Jerusalem, the Judeans on tyrants. But he also mentioned that Titus, in fact, is the one who destroyed the temple. No, if someone quibbles when we talk accusingly about the tyrants, meaning our own, the, the, the Judean tyrants, or the king of robbers, or when we bewail the misfortunes of the homeland, let him show against the rule of historiography forbearance to the emotion against suffering. For it happened that our city had advanced to the highest degree of felicity among all those under the Romans' control, but at last fell down in the worst calamities again. Indeed, I believe that the misfortunes of all people since the beginning of the world are inferior by comparison to those of the Judeans. No outsider is responsible for this, so that it was impossible to restrain it. You know, and so here, Josephus alludes to his conviction that the fall of Jerusalem comes because of the transgressions of his own people, and that for him it's a cause for lament. Should any judge be too severe for compassion, let him describe the facts to history and the lamentations to the writer. Lamentations are impossible to um, ignore in this paragraph. They also recur in the war in a kind of refrain. Josephus expressing his wish, his will to lament the misfortune of his people. So let's look a little bit now, you know, delve a little um, deeper into this text. So there are several motifs in it that are directly drawn for Polybius histories. Um, writing especially about the fall of Carthage and Corinth in 146 BCE, also under the Romans. Same themes of unprecedented suffering. The Greeks are responsible for the calamities. They are all, like, like what Josephus said about the Judeans, it's, it's actually their ultimate responsibilities because of the deficient leadership. Um, and because of the calamities, Bolivius makes his side more expressive, more emotional. And we have exactly the same theme in Josephus, um, asking for forbearance for his um emotional expression. And Polybius also calls for compassion. 
So those references must have been easily recognizable and contributes to Josephus' posture. Polybius is definitely a model for Josephus. So both, in fact, have many um, traits in common. They come from aristocratic families. They were military commanders in the Achaean Judean War. They both advocated for cooperation and or surrender to the Romans. They were taken prisoners and became protégés of the Romans. They then both became historians. They attribute Roman success to 2K, to chance the fate, but perhaps also to divine providence is a wide meaning of the word. Um, they both attribute the final destruction to internecine fights, and they are both critics of Roman brutality. So um, authorial laments, however, cannot be traced back to Polybius or to that matter to any other Hellenistic or Roman historians. So we see both Josephus' imitation of Polybius in full view in that prologue, but also his originality, you know, this expression of lamentation. So why, how, how, how should we interpret those lamentations? So laments in the ancient world, we have them in the, in the Greek world, both professional and spontaneous, we have especially laments for cities that we saw in tragedies. And as we know in the Hebrew Bible as well, both spontaneous and professional, we have laments for individual losses like in Job, but also for communal disasters, especially the fall of Jerusalem in 486, like in Lamentations. Laments for cities, in fact, have roots in Sumerian and Kedian tradition. Um, so laments are also an embodied posture, as you see in that um, funerary plague. Um, they engage on um, the voice and the sound, like moans. This is more than language. Laments are really sound in, um, in the ancient Greek tradition. They also engage the full body, uh, gesture movements, like the ladies um, on the uh, plague. Um, but also prostration, breast beating, tears, tearing, beard or hair. We find that in the Greek tradition and also in the Jewish, both biblical and Hellenistic traditions. Um, so Josephus' poem stages this way with this mention of lamentation is often as a vocal and embodied presence. Um, so, his professed need to lament reinforces his position as a beseecher, pleading with his audience for tolerance and compassion. Um, yeah, so laments are also, um, there's more to laments than just um, kind of an em embodied um, mourning. Laments, both in the biblical and the Greek tradition, were also an expression of emotional resistance. They convey grievances, but can also be a form of protest and resistance under oppression. We have that in the Hebrew Bible, with laments defying mostly divine authority, sometimes even critiquing deity excessive violence. And we have that in the Greek tradition, um, laments are linked to revenge in Homeric literature, and in tragedies, laments are usually associated with unrest and, and uh, revenge, um, like Antigone's laments in Sophocles' Antigone. Um, Antigone laments um, the death of her brother uh, Polynices, but they also accuse Creon for his injustice. Same thing for Electra's lamentation, which incite anger and hatred. Um, we know that uh, Josephus knew that tradition because um, he stages many times in the war characters' laments as a form of protest. So character laments defy authority and contain seeds of rebellion. So I'm going to move quickly here uh, with a few examples. This scene of mourning for um, the young man who removed the golden eagle that Herod put on top of the temple. Um, so um, the population mourned for those young men, this public mourning lamentations, but those lamentations are also um, a way 
to um to resist um Herod and the Roman authorities. They express as well the batting uprising, which is repressed in bloodshed. We have that also for individual, like with Zacharias, a wealthy man, falsely accused by the zealots. He laughs at the accusation, he refutes them, and he details his accusers on crime. So here we have lamentations as a way to debunk slanders. And laments can also be silenced, suggesting that they were indeed understood as a form of insurrection. So this lead us, um, at least that's um, the interpretation that I offered, to read Josephus' laments in his prologue as subversive. Um, they announced Josephus' aim to counter slanders, to correct other accounts of the war, and um, other accounts directed either by flattery for the Romans or the hate for the Jews. And... Um, Josephus laments may be actually to be understood as a way to debunk, to counter those slanders. Um, laments, as we saw, were understand, understood as an act of protest against oppressive power that could be, in fact, um, an expression of Josephus' own um, subversive stance um, against Rome. Um, they could also be read as a strategic oxymoron, kind of an ambiguous stance. They stage a wailing voice, a self-abased body, but also potentially have a transgressive message to restore the dignity of his defeated nation. It echoes Jeremiah and lamentation, but also in tragedy, Greek tragedy, Electro Antigone. Um, while the rest of the poem echoes Polybius. We have that rich tradition behind that um, short text. And um, so I suggest lamentation actually already positioned the Jewish war as an alternative account and as an act of resistance. So now I move to my conclusion. Um, this little case study actually shows um, Josephus' um, work as representative, in fact, of, of the Jewish Hellenistic and Roman experience. So we see the reference to a large intertextual network spanning languages, Hebrew and Greek, and also cultures. Um, Josephus shows him, show himself here and in, in the rest of his work as conversant in several literary, literary and cultural repertoires including the Hebrew Bible, um, which he probably, by the way, reads in its Greek translation, but also Greek literature, including tragedy and historiography. We also mention his deeply ambiguous political posture, self-abased, sometimes resorting to um, flattery, but also between the lines subversive. Um, we saw in that poem, but um, also throughout his work, um, his will to resist the dominant narrative about the recent war. Um, we saw his attempt to construct a new Jewish identity to reinforce the traditional Jewish identity, but also to phrase it for the present in a way to weave past and present. Um, Josephus um, also um, appears, um, you know, kind of is uh, characteristic of the ambivalent social position of Jewish intellectuals, both at least to a certain extent protected with Roman patrons, but also very precarious. Um, and Josephus um, also reminds us that innovation often happens in the margins and that um, how that defeated Jewish historian um, immigrated you know in Rome um, in fact um, offered to history um, like works of a richness that we are still um, deploying today. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I look forward um, to your questions and to the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Francoise. Can you do you want to go directly to the Q and A and see the questions, or do you want me to read it uh, for you? Okay. Um, I can. Uh, the, the, I can if you um want me to do it. The first question is from Carol Simon. Wasn't Herod Edomian? That is, he's a convert. So, what's his story? Yeah, so um, the Idumeans indeed were underwent a forced uh, conversion, totally right. Um, so at least Herod's family, yeah, were from a family of converts. Yeah. Um, I see that actually two questions above that, also for the for the same person. Is a volume a scroll? Um, that's a very, very interesting question the, the, on the support that Josephus um, himself used. Um, so as I said, he wrote first a draft in Aramaic. This could have been a scroll indeed for his work in Greek. Um, I'm, I'm not totally sure if if we have um if we you know because we have the first codices but they're a little later so it's probably yes I'm not a specialist of those questions and those are, are lost in any event we only have copies of copies of copies so uh, so we don't have immediate um immediate um uh, evidence for that question um but we can we make you know uh, guesses um book production what i can say was very local and um communal um task in 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 in, in first century rome so specialist on josephus like steve mason um, believes that um, uh, Josephus may have shared his work as as he as he was writing with a small circle of Roman patrons and Roman Jews. Um, so, but what was really you know what was the support of of those drafts? Um, I, I cannot I cannot really say. But it it may indeed probably have been scrolls. This is this is a very interesting question, and then I'm still gonna actually the very first question that we received. Um, does the Talmud have any references to Josephus and his works? Um, that's actually more a question about the reception of of Josephus. Um, so no, the, the rabbis were not very positive towards Josephus. They had a rather negative view on him, but I hope that um, Professor Stan Cockin can um, tell us more next week about that. Um, yeah, so then I read uh, from uh, Brian Rojas, and sorry if I mispronounce names. So does any of Josephus' works contain any forgeries after time passing? Um, if so, are there ways to find out what he was saying? Yes. So that's that's a great question. And I actually have extra slides to address that question. Um, but the they are actually, well, I don't know how to, um, I'm going to show you that briefly. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. And I'm going to show you actually one example. So this here, um, Josephus, this is the passage in which um, Josephus talks about Jesus. No, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. 
So this um, occurs at the end of the antiquities. Um, this could be a forgery. Um, but, so there is a really complex history of scholarship about this passage. Um, let's say that it was um, so 19th century and most part of the 20th century, the passage was considered to be indeed a forgery. So an appendix, um, an addition by um, Christian revisers. But to, to be able to um, assess such forgeries, we need to look at the history of um, the history of transmission of the text. I'm gonna briefly show you. Um, so we have um, a passage from Origen saying that Josephus did not accept Jesus as Christ, which contradicts this passage. Um, but we also have um, we have another uh, witness which does not include the passage. And Jerome, when quoting that passage, actually mentioned Credebatur esse Christus. He was believed to be the Christ. And we have a um, supporting statement in the Syriac translation, um, which does could indicate an alternate Greek version where Josephus would have um, mentioned, you know, the Messiah, you know, Jesus possibly being Christ, but he was believed to be so. So I'm going to stop here. I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, uh, this, um, yeah. So, but but this kind of answer. So this could be. This is like the 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 the, the prime example of a possible forgery, and I kind of outline the way in which to assess that forgery, that possible forgery. Um, but please, please, I mean, we, we, we can go into more detail, but I, I, I don't, I also want to address the other questions. Um, yeah, so um, a question by Deborah Gersh Gershanok, um, who asked if I could explain what is meant by wife and was it common for statesmen who travel to commit bigamy? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a wife. I mean, uh, Josephus mentions, um, but it was not, it was not, it, it was, those were marriages, but it's not a case of bigamy because he divorced each of those wives. I mean, they were six success, you know, successing in um, succeeding in time. Um, uh, was it common? Um, I, I, um, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, yes. When we read Josephus' history, we do read of rulers having successive wives indeed yes and and for and sometimes for women as well to um to um to to marry different men and sometimes men of the same family um just for the sake of political alliances so yes um yeah, but so um so from the same um from the same guest was Judea part of what you refer to multiple times as as adjacent to a part, yes, a part of Roman Palestine indeed. Um so that's why Palestine is sometimes used for the uh, to, to to talk about the Roman region, because Palestine was only a region of it alongside Samaria and Judea. So you're totally right there. And continuing with um, the same questions from the same person, um, what exactly does Josephus um, point to point to as the specific failings of the Jews that lead to the destruction of the temple? Yeah, it is interesting that he sounds like he was blaming the victims. Yes, I mean that sounds definitely like that. Um, but let's not forget that he's he's continuing there a scriptural tradition. So Professor Stan Cocken may talk about that um, next week when he talks about Josephus 
revisiting um, the, the, um, the biblical past. But this is what the prophets already did with the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians, a way to interpret the, the fall of the city, the destruction of the temple by evoking the sins of the people and seeing it as a cause of divine punishment. And, and I think that to answer your question, we need to go back to that scriptural past um, that in the context of the polytheistic um, ancient Eastern world, the prophet strategy actually makes sense. I mean, in order not to interpret the fall of the temple as um, a defeat of the God, they actually blamed, yes, they blamed the victims, but they blamed the, the people in order to, to vindicate the God, they say, well, no, it was not that our God has been defeated, but he he's punishing us. And this is another, another, you know, another possible meaning is to say, well, we were punished, but if it's God, if indeed history is in the hands of God, then there is also a chance for us to change, to, you know, to change our ways and to hope for a different kind of future. And Josephus is, um, situating himself in that tradition, um, but which indeed could be uh, could have been extremely hard to hear. But we need to hear it coupled with a constant advocacy for his people. And um, I mean, Josephus is also a champion of the Jewish people both um, you know, showing the richness of its theology, of its cultural traditions, um, of, of its past, of its current, uh, of the, the courage of the Jewish troops. Um, um, he also talks in the war in a, in a beautiful passage about his aim to console his people, to console them after the tragedy. Um, so yes, it's a bit, bit of blaming the victim, but especially blaming those also those rebels, those 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 that he called the tyrants, those that that took the lead of the of of the insurrection. Um, so then there is a comment here about um, our colleague uh, Dr. Blake Harton. It's really nice to see um, in this audience. So, um, so he can you wrote, read it out loud, please? Yes, yes. So it's crazy to think about how much of our knowledge of ancient Judaism and Judea comes from the works of Josephus. Josephus' works are a great example of how precarious our knowledge of the ancient world can be. Sorry, this isn't a question, but I'm sure you have something more to say about how valuable Josephus is for our knowledge of Jews and Judaism in antiquity. Yeah, I mean, a really wonderful, beautiful comments here, showing on the one hand the value of Josephus. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's take archaeology, for example. I mean, if we, you know, walking through Israel, we wouldn't understand much of Israel today without Josephus. You know, think about the Herodian, Masada, um, even the even Qumran, um, all of those places actually take meaning from the, from the from from the writings of Josephus. We wouldn't know what the Her Herodian was um, if we didn't have Josephus. Um, and at the same time, also Professor Blake mentioned, you know, the precarity of our knowledge. Yes, especially in this case, we don't have we don't have many other witnesses of of that period, and Josephus is situated like like any author. He is writing in a certain um, in a certain you know, in very particular political and social circumstances, um, and in this case, he also has very, you know different loyalties to um, to to you know, to, to, to engage. So, um, um, so yes, I mean, that, that really shows the, the situatedness of, of any, of any historian. Yeah. 
Um, so going back actually to Jesus, so isn't his mention of Jesus? There's a question um, by Margaret Kennedy. Um, isn't his mention of Jesus often used as proof of Jesus' existence? Um, yes. So if if we recognize that um, that passage as authentic, it's yes, it is. Um, there is also no really real proof against it, um, but um, but yes, I mean it is it, it is definitely. I mean, if it's authentic, yes, it is. Um, copies of the recording. I think that um, Lisa actually answered that questions before. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question, and also I'll just draw your attention that there is one question uh, in the chat. Okay. So and it's uh, the question, which I'll, I'll say what I'm going to say, and then I'll ask you the question. Um, the This will all be available as a, a recording. You will get a thank you uh, for attending tomorrow um, and with a link to the recording in it. Um, also, uh, in about a week, it should be available up on our YouTube page. Um, so those are two ways you can get to it. Um, but the easiest is, um, as a registered guest, you will get, um, you will get a link to the recording that you will be able, only you will be able to access it though. So, um, otherwise, uh, the general public will have to either register or wait, um, until it goes up onto our U YouTube page to have access to it. And that question is, um, did Josephus know of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai's prophecy that this was it Vespasian and Titus would be the emperors I don't know if you saw that so yeah that's great um <laughs> great question um he I don't know I mean I don't know what he knew but he actually he attributes that prophecy to himself as the one who who received that prophecy so um is it a, i mean that this you know that's the mystery i mean you know did he knew at the time indeed is it a reconstruction um in his work uh was he aware of other you know of other prophecies um or they actually really prophecies or more like um like an informed political analysis or a fortunate political analysis. So all of that is difficult to say. But he he phrases, he constructs um he the circumstances of his um uh, of his release as the consequences of indeed a prophecy. Um then uh, I think I have two more questions. Um, one by Yanis Siligakis. Um, again, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, are there any references by Josephus contradicting the New Testament? Excellent question, or vice versa. More specifically, I mean, referring to the slaughter of the babies in Bethlehem by Herod. Is this incident called? corroborated by Josephus. No, it is not. Um, so this is an event that is, first of all, unlikely, that it's not corroborated, that is not mentioned by Josephus. Um, so that probably needs to be read symbolically in the Gospels. It's probably part of an attempt to present um, the childhood of Jesus in parallel with the childhood of Moses and um, both of them escaping um, an early massacre as, as babies. Um, so that's, I mean, that the New Testament um, is, that's not, uh, I mean, that, uh, not a history, it's not a historical event and indeed it's not corroborated by Josephus. But I'm interested in, in 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 the question more generally about um among I see something in the chat. Um 
Um, I think Josephus mentioned it. It is better to be a pig than a son. Uh, a son of Herod was a play on the Greek words for pig, and so, well, I'm I'm not I'm not aware of that actually. Um, uh, I mean, Josephus certainly reports the cruelty of Herod. Um, yeah, as you as you write, um, with with his own sons. So, so that's for sure. But the, the pun I'm, I'm not aware of. Uh, maybe Professor Stankokin is. Um, are you, Daniel? I mean, if, if you wanted to jump in in any way. Um... I'm not either, but I, I will definitely check up on it to see uh, yeah. where I am on. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great question about like the discrepancies, different kind of accounts between the New Testament and Josephus, because there are, you know, two different witnesses on that, on that period. Um, uh, I mean, no example comes to mind, but I will, I will go back to it if something, if something comes to mind. And there is a follow up also on the blaming the victim. Um, oh, there is some, um, yes, that's true. Yeah, there's also a reference to the death of James, the brother of Jesus. And there also, there's also a, a, a passage that was actually on my slide, I didn't show it. And another one on, um, on, um, uh, on John the Baptist as well. Yeah. And, um, and and yeah and and indeed um, as Professor Hutton said I don't think many scholars have questions the authenticity of that passage now, because James is called um, brother of Jesus and usually when Christians write about you know siblings of Jesus they they add oh it was more like a cousin or supposedly brother they they add something to preserve the idea of the of the virginity of Mary so the fact that Josephus talks about um, the brother. Um, uh, the James, the brother of Jesus, that that's probably um, authentic. So, so the, there is, in fact, I mean, that's a very good point because that indicates that there is a reference to um, to uh, to Jesus in Josephus that is um, most likely authentic. So that's that's actually a really um, interesting point to answer the previous question. Um. So let's go back. So I know they have some um, comments in the chat. It, it's great, by the way, to interact with you all. So thank you for that. But I want to address the last question and then we can go back to those comments. Um, so the, the one by Henri Blumenthal. So if we believe that there is divine oversight over this world, then Josephus point that Romans were the tool chosen by um, divinity to punish the Judean for it, for the faults makes sense. It does not remove the guilt from the perpetrator. Nobody forced the Romans to do what they did, but explain why heavens permitted that to happen. Yeah, yeah, in, indeed. Um, and... Um, so, and as I said, there are precedents to that, to that kind of view. I mentioned um, the scriptural, you know, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures doing that. Um, but in fact, also Polybius, you know, to a certain extent, attributing the, 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 the victory of the Romans um, over the Greeks as, as 2K. So, which could be chance of fate, but could also be divine providence um, and suggesting a sort of divine um, ascent there. Um, although Polybius and Josephus had probably different different aims there. Um, um, yeah, I mean, different, yeah, we, we can... Um, we can phrase, I mean, also, don't, don't I think we, we should also keep in mind that Josephus is writing primarily to um, the, the Jews in Rome uh, who, who didn't, um, who, in, you know, didn't participate 
in that revolt, but are suffering from the, you know, the, the anti-Judaism of their peers, of, you know, of, 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 of the Roman contemporaries. Um, so Josephus is also navigating that and trying also to offer those Roman Jews a positive, um, a positive view of, of their own history. Um, and then, so I'm moving to a few more comments. Um, You've here, got some issues on the in the chat. You have to resolve the number issues. Uh, the number issue, okay. Um, oh yes, so so here we are going back to um, we're going back to Bethlehem and the the massacre of those the the alleged massacre of those babies under Herod. And so um, uh, what guest uh, Brian Rojas writes, so Bethlehem was a relatively small place, so the mention is not literal. Yes, of course, the number of infants killed is not specified in the biblical text. And actually, the, the, the number that was previously mentioned um, is associated with the passage in Revelation. So here, so the quote, it is better to be Herod's pig than its son is a pun in the Greek, who's um, an uyos um, for son. Yeah. So I'm going to try to find that quote to, to see where it is um, in, in Josephus. Um, yeah, the number is not that. And... Um, yeah, so the number, I mean, yeah, and uh, so uh, another here from Yanis Tsiligakis um, saying that the revelation, in Revelation, the number of babies killed is 14,000. And fortunately, we, Professor Hatung, thank you. Um, so there's no number given in Matthew's narrative, but later Christian traditions develop that number in all sorts of ways. Thank you so much, Blake. For that um for that note and that clarification um and can uh can i just jump on for one second this is lisa um i just want to encourage people um that who haven't signed up for next next week and the week after um to visit our website to do that um and we will also Put a link in the email uh, for that as well. Um, Francois, by way of kind of last question, maybe, or, or as we are coming to the end of the program, can you comment a little bit about the uniqueness of the historiography of uh, Josephus? Do we have other Jewish authors at the time who produce a similar text? And if we don't, why don't we? So, I mean, we certainly don't have anything comparable to Josephus. I mean, that's the, the extent of Josephus' works is, um, is absolutely unique. We have a little bit more historiography in Philo. Uh, so Philo has two historiographic works, uh, which actually are also eyewitnesses in which um, Philo talks about in his embassy to Rome um, mm -hmm. to talk about, to advocate um, for the Jewish population in Alexandria and its safety. Um, and so that's, um, so that's another example of Jewish historiography, but it's nothing of the size of Josephus. Um, I would add, Two, two, also two particularities of, of Josephus' work, I mean, among many, but one is the, the scope. So he doesn't only talk about um, the events that he witnessed, but he, we're going to talk about it, kind of introducing what we will do next week, but he, his attempt is to give a comprehensive um, account of Jewish history from the origins to his day. And that's that's what Professor Stein Cockin is going to you know, tell us about next week. And um, 
And the other particularity of Josephus is the life, his life that he writes, um, it, you know, kind of a partial autobiography, um, which is a very innovative genre, in fact, in Western tradition. And, and we know the, you know, the, the growth, the inspiration of that, of that, you know, of that genre on, on you know, on, on literature up to today. So th those are two major innovations of Josephus um, beyond the scope. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you have a, a question or comment that you would like to share? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for Francoise, uh, Francoise for such a wonderful start to, to the series. I hope I'll be able to, to match what you've done uh, next week and the week after. Uh, I guess I have two questions, and you feel free to pick one or ignore both or uh, as you like. So one, you noted the parallels between Polybius and Josephus and how Josephus, Josephus actually imitates Poly Polybius in many respects. And one of the things, if I, if I call you, that you were suggesting that Josephus, one of the things that he imitates from Polybius is also the, the, you know, the emphasis for his respect for the, his people to, to defer to Rome and to, and to basically give, you know, give, give in to Rome if I, if I if I correct, that was one of the things you also. I, I miss one word. I'm sorry, Daniel. I miss one one word of you of what you said. Sorry. It sounded like you were suggesting that one of the things, one of the similarities between Josephus and Polybius, yeah. is that they both appeal to their respective uh, publics to to defer to Rome and to mm -hmm. and and so then I'm wondering if we see that Josephus is modeling. Part, important parts of his narrative after or his explanation after Polybius, does that, how does that affect our sense of Josephus's reliability when he tells us that he advocated for submission to Rome in the, in the actual plot of the Jewish war? Is it possible that this is something that he is in a sense getting from Polybius? That's one question. Uh, and then the other thing is how do we understand, and you said this is also something that's in Polybius, how do we make sense or understand the respective author's willingness or ability to critique Roman brutality. Uh, if we think about Josephus as a as a as subject to you know Roman uh, Flavian uh, you know, support uh, in Rome and being there, and and when we see in other aspects of his narrative a clear sign, you know maybe flattery is sometimes too strong, but certainly there is some of that, and there definitely is a, is an is an interest typically in writing in such a way that it will be pleasing to to the Flavians and to the Roman elite and so forth. So how do we make sense of the willingness then on other occasions to critique Roman brutality? Is it something that, was there sort of a, were the Roman, did the Romans tolerate this to some degree as a kind of escape valve in some respects? Uh, did they like to be seen as, as, as brutal perhaps in some respects because it emphasized their, their power? What, what's your take on how to make sense of the fact that Josephus is willing to to go in, in that place, and the same as Polybius, who was also in Rome. Yeah, those are, those are wonderful questions. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, for the first question, so how much is um, Josephus? Um, uh, recommendation to surrender to Rome, uh, how much are that, you know, th those expressions to be understood as authentic as will be coming back from Josephus or um, being, um, coming from his modeling Polybius. Um, I mean, it, it there is also, as I pointed earlier, there are also some slight differences between um, the account of the war and the account of the life on that subject. So that's also the question to say how much should we, you know, how should we interpret that discrepancy? Um, should we read the life in that in that sense as a corrective? you know, perhaps as a response to criticisms that Josephus received, and then a way to, you know, to adjust and really make sure that from the beginning, Josephus recommended submission and was really never a proponent of the revolt. Um, 
So I, I don't think that, um, I mean, also Josephus has had a model, I mean, Herodotus, um, Thucydides. So um, Poly Polybius, uh, we see his influence, especially on, on that prologue. Um, so I don't think that as as, as such it, it is, um, you know, that dependence or inspiration from Polybius is um, uh, should should play too much of a role in explaining, um, you know, in explaining this. It, it's it more it seems also more creative to me as a way for Josephus to find his own posture and to find a model of a you know of of an um, you know can a, a historian writing history from the perspective of the defeated in a way that you know co compromises um find you know um, talks both about the dignity of his own people but also the force of the woman and then moving to your other question i really like um you know the, the way you articulated that ambiguity and i think that's that you express it in a very clear way that for Josephus, it was finding the right balance between criticism and um, highlighting, unveiling the cruelty of the Roman forces from the troops to the governors to, to the emperors themselves, but also flattery of, 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 the, of the emperors. You, you, you mentioned really uh, in a very interesting way that perhaps the Romans did appreciate uh, mention of the, the cruelty of the troops um, uh, as a way to, you know, to, um, to, 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 to hint at the overwhelming force. Um, although those passages are not really, are not uh, clearly not flattering. I mean, that's... Uh, I, I don't think that was really meant as such, uh, but it's it's really about finding the right balance. We could also ask, you know, did the did the, the emperors really um, did they really read Josephus' work? You know, did they read the full manuscript? Um, so Josephus appends a letter from the emperor, and I think that in it the emperor. Titus uh, mm -hmm. actually mentions. Uh, having read it well, uh, um support at least support of it but you know is it authentic and uh, so you know it's 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 a very long work it takes time to read the full war and the full antiquities so um yeah i mean it's 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 about finding the right balance but i do think that josephus um especially when we read um the text between the lines um it, it's it's that's show audacity so um what would have happened if he didn't end up in rome would he have written the the two histories or well, you know probably not mm -hmm. and that goes um, back to the question of uh ori blumenthal kind of if if there's divine providence going on in re in jewish history do we need to write this kind of history Mm -hmm. oh, but when he's writing to a Roman audience, yeah, uh, he's he's playing the game as a as a Roman game, not as a Jewish game. Yeah, yeah. Also, simply, it's also probable that he didn't study Greek literature um, in Jerusalem, so mm. he 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 may have you know probably some command of Greek, but he probably didn't read the Greek tragedies and Thucydides, Polybius while in Jerusalem, so. Mm. And those are still, you know, are very important references of his work as well. I mean, part of the genius is to to weave those different uh, those different cultural influences. And that, I mean, if he had not not gone to Rome, it is at least less probable that he would have had access to that literature and to those models. Mm -hmm. All right, this is fascinating and it's to be continued. Uh, we had a question whether there is part two. Yes, indeed, there is part two next Wednesday at the same time. And Daniel Stein Cocking is going to help us with a question How Josephus read the Jewish past 
And the subtitle is the first century historian rewrites the Bible. Okay, so how does he use the biblical text? And the week after that, Daniel, again, is going to help us with a question, who's Josephus? And the subtitle is the first century historians afterlives among Christians and Jews. So all the questions that we are still having about uh, Josephus will be able to address next week to Daniel. And thank you very much, Francoise. This was wonderful. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you all next week and the week after that. So good night and thanks.